Hi, everyone. Today, I'm extremely excited to be speaking with Dr. Britton Jowers. Dr. Jowers is a doctor of physical therapy and a therapeutic pain specialist. She is certified in pain reprocessing therapy and certified as a health and life coach. She is currently working in an outpatient orthopedic clinic in Silverdale, Washington, where she moved from Austin, Texas to pursue her growth in the field of pain neuroscience. Britain is always studying materials regarding the human experience, societal, cultural patterns, the nervous system, neuroscience, trauma, development, spiritual teachings, meditation, healing, and the mind-body connection. She lives with her husband and two big dogs. So, Britain, thank you very much for joining me, and I look forward to this conversation. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. So we're talking about pain today and just everything about pain and pain neuroscience. And this is a very important topic because there's so many people, as you see every day, that are out there struggling with pain. We have a nationwide opioid crisis that we've just been through that is a direct result of the, let's say, the, the misuse of pain thera therapeutics and modalities. And so we want to address this uh, and really get to the heart of it. So that's really what I'm looking forward to digging into today. I want to start, though, first just by asking you about your own journey into physical therapy and into pain neuroscience. So if you could tell us a little bit about that, that would be great. Sure. Um, so I never had physical therapy until I was in physical therapy school myself. Um, before physical therapy, I wanted to... Uh, work with deaf children. I was near fluent in American Sign Language. And my senior year of high school, I took anatomy and physiology, which I just absolutely loved. And I found so fascinating to really learn the, the inner workings of our bodies. I just thought it was really amazing. And also that year, I took a job as a math tutor. Um, and I loved that job so much. And it was so similar to how physical therapy is. Um, and I'll explain that by saying, you know, at first, we, you know, we would have kiddos come in and we would give them an assessment. And these kiddos, you know, would, would be struggling in math. They would feel really behind and feel like they were dumb and that they were never going to be good at math. Um, and we would give them an assessment um, kind of find those areas that had, um, you know, that, that could be supplemented. And then we would supplement those based off of those areas that were um, a little bit weaker and really kind of facilitate those skills and help that, you know, child find those answers on their own with like Socratic questioning and things like that. It wasn't anything that I was doing for them. It was just encouraging them and helping them to find the answers. Um, and it was just really rewarding to see their confidence grow, to see themselves, you know, um, get better to make those improvements. We would do reassessments and that's kind of, it, it was just so rewarding and it was so, so cool to kind of, you know, as a senior in high school, kind of put my love for anatomy and physiology and then, you know, my passion for, you know, the work that I was doing as a math tutor and combine those and go, oh, that's physical therapy, because that's exactly what I do as a physical therapist. Um, you know, people who come in and feel really discouraged of they're never going to you know, learn to, or, you know, they're never going to be able to do this again or that or those things that they love. And then to kind of walk alongside them, not do anything for them, but help lead them, you know, to returning to those things on their own. Um, and so that's what led me to physical therapy. Um, as far as the pain neuroscience piece goes, um, when I was a student, we went to like our combined sections meeting. That's kind of like the American Physical Therapy Association's um, like big national conference. And I went as a student in New Orleans um, and I went to a lecture that was called Everyone's Pain is Different. Um, and this was given by Dr. Adrian Lowe and Dr. Corey Zimney. Um, who are uh, fantastic pain neuroscientists and, and physical therapists um, who, you know, um, 
pioneer a lot of the research around you know pain and chronic pain and i was listening to um this lecture that they were giving and i wasn't even in the room with them i was in an overflow room because this conference or this you know particular lecture was so popular mm -hmm. um and i was listening to it on the little airline headphones you know with a little channel to, and the right. and, and the quality was so poor and um but i was i was still able to hear you know the words that they were saying and i just remember getting this like profound feeling of um meaning it, it, yes it was it was the feeling of like it was the the truth hit me right in the face and i got this profound feeling of this is what i was put here to do um it felt so true to me and it felt so real um and so you know kind of since then i've been learning all that i can about pain and neuroscience from so many different lenses and perspectives um, to, to truly understand it um, so that I can best show up as a provider and help people understand more about what's what's going on so that they don't feel so afraid so that they can return to their lives and um, just live their lives with the joy that yeah. that all humans deserve. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and I'm, I'm so glad that you found your passion and your calling. So for people who are at the very basic level and just understanding pain, can you just tell us what is pain and what is the exact science behind it in terms of what your body goes through and what it experiences? Yeah, so, you know, pain works as a danger signal. Um, if you put your hand on a hot stove, pain is going to let you know to move your hand so that you don't, you know, continue to injure yourself further. Mm -hmm. Um, it's essentially the, the simplest way that, that I can explain it. Um, sometimes though, these danger signals can get activated even in the absence of any kind of, uh, you know, structural damage. Um, and so if there was an initial injury, when you develop an injury, there is acute tissue damage. Um, and during this time, the, the brain creates pain pathways. Um, but the brain doesn't always simply forget these uh, pathways once the injury is healed. Um, so the body can heal, um, and the, the body is designed to heal itself, but the pain pathways in our central nervous system are still there and still cause very real pain. And so there's been a lot of recent research showing that these learned neural pathways in our nervous system can cause many forms of persistent pain um, and not necessarily that original tissue damage. Mm -hmm. So when you say pain pathways, do you mean that those pathways exist to start off with or as you develop the pain in response to an injury, for example, the stove example that you mentioned, where you touch the stove and you have pain because of the heat, those pathways are, are then created? Um, so, you know, depending on how long that pain is going on for, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times we understand, oh, I touched a hot stove. So, you know, I understand that like that's going to hurt. Um, but my body is going to, you know, heal, heal itself. Mm -hmm. um, now, if you were to compare this with like, like a back injury, when somebody experiences a back injury and, you know, they expect that to heal and to get better, but that um, those pain pathways kind of get laid down and the nervous system um, learns that pain, you know, a lot of times after any kind of acute tissue damage heals, like within the body's like normal healing, um, time frame, those learned neural pathways can still be there. And so we say, you know, we have the saying in the, in the pain neuroscience world, neurons that fire together, wire together. Mm -hmm. right. um, and so, you know, the more that our body is, um, you know, exposed to this pain and depending on, you know, the state of our nervous system going into that, there's so many things that go into this, you know, um, 
going all the way back to, you know, how did our nervous system develop as children? You know, what kind of environment did we grow up in, whether it was one where, you know, safety was cultivated regularly or, um, or if there were any dangers, you know, if, if there is any history of um, trauma or um, mm -hmm. I was listening to your conversation with um, Alexia uh, Gonzalez mm -hmm. Lowe, which I just thought was absolutely wonderful because it just goes so hand in hand with our conversation today. Yeah. Um, it, it, it all just kind of depends on the history of that person's nervous system. Um, and, and whether or not, um, you know, they're, they're kind of primed, um, to, to experience persistent pain. Um, okay. And it's all just part of our nervous system's, mm. like, primitive, um, survival mechanism. Yeah. So right now we have these, we have the pain mechanisms that you mentioned, or the pain pathways rather, and they contain these pain receptors, right? Because pain is it's a perception correct so mm -hmm. you're basically saying that someone two people can do the exact same act injury let's say and feel different levels of pain mm -hmm. Be, and even though the injury or the mechanism is the exact same but their the, their pathways differ and their perception of that pain differs correct absolutely yes um and that's part of the um, mature organism model where, you know, the way I'll kind of explain to people is, you know, you're always kind of surveying your body, your nervous system's always taking in information from the environment as well as mm -hmm. what's going on inside. And then it sends that information up, you know, to your central processor and that gets, you know, um, those signals get processed and interpreted um, and then we get that output, which is pain. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, given two different people's experiences, we could have two very different responses. Right. Which is very interesting then when we look at our current modalities that we have in treating pain, which is, as is most things in conventional medicine, is very uniform, right? So the, the, the same two people come into a pain medicine or uh, a, a clinic that deals with pain, they will get more or less the same treatment, right? We're talking about first-line drugs, second-line drugs, and, and so on. So mm -hmm. that, I think, is underlies what's going wrong because what works for one person may not work for the other person. So is it more so that our current approach to pain is that we are using different medications at various levels of the pathway trying to block this pain? That's what our, our go-to is? Um, give me, um, if, if you could give me a little clarification mm -hmm. on, um, on what you're asking. So basically, uh, what I mean to say is our current approach to pain in most of the pain medicine facilities that, that we currently have is that when a patient goes in, we are really trying to use more pharmaceutical medications to relieve their pain, right? That could be as simple mm -hmm. as Tylenol or ibuprofen, all the way up to uh, narcotics and uh, pain blocks and things like that. But what we're trying to do essentially in all situations is to block at some point in that pathway that is causing the pain and the, the pathways that you just talked about. So that's what's going on right now. So that then when I think about where things can fall short, then it comes to me that you know, it is the two people with different types of pain are, are really getting treated the same way, more or less. And I think that that is one of the downfalls, that there isn't necessarily a multifactorial or multidisciplinary approach to pain. Um, yes, I, I, would, I would agree with that. Um, you know, I think that a lot of our, you know, kind of go-to interventions, uh, it's, you know, tend to be bottom-up. Um, you know, like you said, uh, things that kind of, you know, block or, or are dealing with, um, you know, bottom up versus a, a top down approach um, and or bottom up purely only in, instead of blending that with a top down approach. Mm -hmm. um, and I think kind of where we fall short in the medical community is just a lack of looking through 
that biopsychosocial lens or the human first lens. Um, right. And just the overall lack of knowledge about the neuroscience behind our mm-hmm. brain's survival mechanisms. Um, and I'll yeah. always explain to patients, you know, like it, it, it's nothing bad on, on, you know, those doctors or, you know, those, those providers that you've seen in the past, it's just a lack of awareness and knowledge mm-hmm. because this, you know, the, the deeper neuroscience behind pain is just not taught in, yeah. in medical school and physical therapy school. Um, yeah. And there's so much important um, science that's, that's there. Um, and yeah. so, yeah, I think that's always important to say. Right. And so I want to dig into that important neuroscience that you're talking about. And, you know, you are basically doing pain reprocessing therapy. So I want to understand that more and the science behind that. What exactly is that? And what is the science behind that? Yeah. So um, pain reprocessing therapy is essentially working with um, breaking the pain fear cycle. Um, and when we have a lot of fear and preoccupation around the pain, it reinforces to the brain that the pain is dangerous and then therefore the pain persists. Um, and so, you know, I'll explain the pain fear cycle and talk about how pain triggers feelings of fear. Mm-hmm. And then the fear puts the brain on high alert um, and kind of causes this like state of hypervigilance, uh, which causes more pain, which leads to more fear, which leads to more pain. And so we kind of get stuck in this pain fear cycle. Um, and so we can break this cycle by shifting our perspective of the pain and thinking of it as completely safe. And this starts with learning some of the neuroscience behind pain in a way that makes sense to the patient that I'm working with and doesn't feel scary or, um, you know, biomedical language is, is really terrifying, you know, to, to the average person and not to, you know, maybe not necessarily to people like you or I, um, but, um, it, it, it can be really fear inducing, Um, And so explaining the neuroscience to people in a way that makes sense, this is typically done with like metaphors or stories um, so that it doesn't feel so, um, so that it doesn't feel so scary. Um, And we can actually break that pain fear cycle. Mm -hmm. So if I was to take an example for people to understand, let's say take low back pain. Right. So if you take low back pain and that's something that so many millions of Americans suffer from it chronically, and you say that you've ruled out a lot of the red flag type of things that it can be, make sure it's not tumors or anything that's that's extremely concerning, that's acute and that needs to be dealt with right away. We're talking about the chronic pain that is likely musculoskeletal, maybe involving the disc. Right. So with that pain is the idea that you're not necessarily changing anatomy or physiology in this reprocessing uh, that you're talking about, but you're, you're, you're changing the person's perception around their own pain so that when the way that they think about their own pain is, is just in a much more positive light, and that can have an effect downstream on the signals to the brain that can actually ultimately decrease their pain. So it's, it's almost like, would it be accurate to consider it like a, a placebo effect that you're trying to put onto the brain? Um, really, really good question. Um, because pain reprocessing therapy was actually, um, when they put it into a randomized control trial, the, the study was originally for an open label placebo. Um, mm-hmm. And so they actually, you know, they added PRT um, yeah. to that, that study on, on open label placebo. I would say that you said earlier, you know, that, you know, you're not necessarily changing anything anatomically. Um, 
or, or physiologically, I would actually argue that you, you do change things physiologically. Mm -hmm. um, because if you can shift the areas of, essentially what this does is it changes the areas of, the, of, of activation um, and the way that that signal gets processed in the brain. So you get a shift in activation of the areas of the brain that instead of being, you know, those fear centers lighting up, Mm -hmm. um, you, you get a shift in, in how the brain is activated. And then when those okay. fear areas in the brain are not activated, we actually get a, uh, a physiological difference um, versus, you know, mm. if, if the brain is detecting fear, our, our brain is the one that's responsible for sending in, you know, um, our immune system, activating our immune system, uh, mm causing inflammation right. and in the body and, and, and those types of things. Um, so that's always something that, that I want to, yeah. So you're, go ahead. Yeah. So you're essentially kind of down regulating those pathways in, in, in that mm -hmm. sense through this positive feedback because of the signal in the brain will less of the, um, pain centers are going to light up less of the, pa the pathways, the way I'm visioning it, 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 the pathways are, going to end up shrinking and that will cause less local pain in the area. So um, that's fascinating because you're taking a whole different approach to mm -hmm. what we're trying to do or, or, or rather what we currently do, which is just to think of it as an injury in an area, the pain is going to the brain in these pathways and we're just trying to block, 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 right? In, in you are trying to get into the root of it and and fix that. So I think that that's extremely important for those people that have tried everything under the sun for their pain, but have not been able to fix it, which is medications, uh, procedures, all sorts of things. And they, they can't get the pain to improve, but they're maybe going about it the wrong way. They really need to reprocess the pain. So I think that that's, it's very important for, especially for those people suffering with um, any kind of intractable pain. Yeah, absolutely. You know, when when somebody is struggling with chronic or persistent pain, the, the very primitive part of, you know, their nervous system is just on high alert, right? It's detecting dangers left and right. Um, and they're kind of living in that um, just persistent state of danger. And so what, mm. what I try to do as a provider is decrease those danger signals um, you know, decrease the danger by telling them more mm -hmm. about their pain and what it means. Um, decrease that threat and fear mm -hmm. using pain neuroscience education, using words that heal, um, that help provide clarity and decrease that stress and confusion. And then on the other hand, you know, increase safety, really building therapeutic mm -hmm. alliance because healing takes place when the body is um, under a state of... Um, uh, of safety. Um, and so doing things like yeah. asking questions, listening to, you know, listening to patients, validating them, um, you know, utilizing compassion and empathy and always meeting the patient where they're at. I think that's the biggest thing with, you know, especially yeah. considering pain reprocessing therapy, um, but, you know, just trying to meet the patient where they're at and, and, you know, introducing these tools in a way that, um, you know, or, or, or at a le level that the patient is ready for, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to shift and ask you about medications a little bit, because um, obviously that's a big component of how pain is being treated right now. So as you're doing pain re reprocessing therapy in your center or your center's um, is there a conjunction with pain medication that you're doing? So, so it's both modalities working together, or is it more that they have their pain medi medicine doctor, they're seeing them for prescription medications and then utilizing this modality as well? You know, a lot of times, um, you know, patients that come to me, they, they are taking a uh, pain medication or at least like a membrane stabilizer drug, like abapentin or Cymbalta, Lyrica, those types of things. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, oh, and, and sometimes people come to me and they go, I, 
I don't like medication. My body doesn't like medication. I, I don't want medication. I don't want to have to do this. Um, and so everyone's a little bit different in that aspect. I think that you can utilize, um, you know, these, these principles that we're talking about, um, you know, whether or not the patient is on medication. But this is what I tell people mm. about pain medication. Um, you know, I, I talk about... Um, a lot of times when people come to me, I'll talk about the nerves a lot um, and yeah. how our nervous system can kind of get um, ramped up uh, and it's all intended to protect yeah. us. Um, and, the, and a way that we can help nerves calm down is using medicine. So, um, and, and I'll say all questions about your medication should be directed to your doctor, right? That is because I'm a physical therapist. That is not my sure. role. Um, but I'll say if your extra sensitive nervous system or ramped up, you know, kind of your body's alarm system uh, limits your movement, uh, limits your exercise and your therapy, then these medications can help kickstart your progress. Um, and, and that over time medication should be tapered and ceased with the help of your doctor. Um, but then I'll also explain yep. that, did you know that your brain produces pain medicine as well? Um, sure. and the brain has a really powerful drug cabinet, um, that can produce, you know, pain medication 50 times more powerful than the, you know, most powerful mm -hmm. narcotic on the market. Um, and um, in, in the pain neuroscience world, we call this a wet brain. And that wet brain is filled with lots of healthy drugs mm -hmm. that kind of flush down to ease those incoming danger messages and then ultimately your pain experience. Yeah. Um, but I'll explain that in people with ongoing pain, the pain medicine in the brain isn't, um, it, it dries up. It's still there. It's just... Um, the brain does this to protect you. The brain takes away the pain medicine to make you mm -hmm. more sensitive so that you'll do something about it. Right. Um, and that there are lots of things that we can do to turn that dry brain back into a wet brain. Um, mm -hmm. And this right. is lots of things that can kind of um, be used in adjunct with medication, but help you access your body's natural pain medication um, again. Mm -hmm. And this is a whole list of things, including knowledge, um, understanding more about your pain and how yeah. it works and what pain really means. Things like aerobic exercise, things like sleep, things like meditation and relaxation, breath work, mm -hmm. um, you know, journaling, expressive writing, coping skills, social interaction, laughter, humor, um, all of those types of things yeah. can really help. Um, mm -hmm help your help you access your bodies yeah approach, uh, natural medicine again yeah mm -hmm. yeah and i bring up medication because obviously we've gone through this big opioid crisis and i think that that stemmed from taking the the problem of pain suffered by so many millions of people and just not having enough of a balanced approach, which like you just mentioned right now, if all those things were working together in conjunction with using pain, pain medication sparingly as as less as we can, then we wouldn't be in this the mess that we're in. So um, I think that that's really important to highlight if we're talking about pain. And yeah. the other thing is that, um, you know, I did an episode with Dr. John Kim on low-dose naltrexone. And, um, you know, I'm not sure how much you um, are familiar with it or, or utilize it, but it's it's just becoming a very interesting uh, medication that is much safer than, the, uh, than opiates and helpful in acting as a weak agonist to the opiate re receptors and upregulating your own endorphins and in, uh, downregulating the inflammatory pathways. So I think there's a lot of promise to using something like low-dose naltrexone on the medication side in conjunction with every single thing that you said um, just now on the pain reprocessing side. So 
Yeah, yeah, you know, that's that's really interesting. And I'll have to go back and give that episode a listen because um, I did have a, um, a patient of mine last year who was talking about uh, low-dose low naltrexone as part of her, um, uh, you know, medication plan that she was yeah. utilizing with her doctor. And I was doing a lot of pain neuroscience education with her at the time. And she was so just all in of like yeah. this, it, it just really really spoke to her. Um, and so it's nice to see how, you know, those two worlds can kind of, um, uh, instead of being opposing, you know, work together, right. Until those mm -hmm. things aren't necessarily needed anymore. Yeah, absolutely. There's very fascinating science be behind Lotus naltrexone. So, um, I'll definitely send you some stuff on that. Awesome. Um, Thanks. So as we approach the end, I wanted to ask you about some of the clinical cases that you've seen in implementing pain reprocessing therapy and some of the success you've had with that. So I'd love to hear a couple of cases if you have so that people can really see this, uh, you know, being implemented and have really good, um, just, you know, have a really good view of it and uh, a, a very realistic approach to it. Yeah, um, so I think I would start by saying um, in incorporating, you know, pain reprocessing therapy into my work, um, I've learned um, or, and am still learning that clinical discernment in noticing, like, who, who it is appropriate for, who is ready for mm -hmm. it. Um, and I kind of do this by... Uh, gauging a person's beliefs, um, you know, because if a person comes to me with very firm beliefs about their pain, um, mm -hmm. you know, that are uh, you know, structural in nature um, and they're not necessarily um, open or ready, um, mm -hmm. this is not something I would I would force on, on to sure. the person. Uh, you know, I'm always trying to listen for those open doors. Um my number one thing that I do as a provider is to establish therapeutic alliance and mm -hmm. create that safe healing environment. That's my number one priority. And so I always want to make sure that, you know, I, I'm on the patient's side. It's not mm -hmm. about me being right, um, right. you know, with, with the neuroscience that I know. Um, I, I always want to meet the patient where they're at and say, hey, I'm 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 here to, to help you in, in mm -hmm. the best way that I can. Um, you know, in in my experience so far, um, I I think PRT works best as a blended approach with movement. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I am a physical therapist, uh, and so I like to pair it with movement to have a person realize that okay, you know. The pain is there, but it's not necessarily, um, you know, I, I don't have to run away from it. Instead, mm -hmm. I can kind of lean into it as long as that pain is like low to moderate, right? As long as right. the alarm isn't going off so high um, that they can't hear, you know, anything else. Um, you know, I always wait. I always say you want to you want to flirt with the pain, right? Just kind of like tease the pain. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we can do that with, with movement um, and then help, help the person kind of break that, that pain fear cycle. But I'll just give you an example. Um, I had a person um, this, uh, this past year who, she's 29, um, she had bilateral ankle and foot and leg pain. So this initially started with, she had like a bad ankle sprain on one ankle. And then like the following year, she twisted her other ankle and like broke part of her like navicular bone, something like that. And when she came to me, she was like only wearing her husband's work boots. Um, she wouldn't wear any other uh, like types of shoes. Um, she had eight out of 10 pain. Um, and you know, I, I did an evaluation with her and the, the, the first thing I did was, was introduce some safe movement, um, movement that did not feel mm -hmm. dangerous to her. 
um, because her legs were just so lit up. Um, you know, she told me, I'm starting to get pain like in my upper thigh and like my hip. And I told my doctor that and he just looked at me like I was crazy. Um, and mm -hmm. me knowing about, you know, the neuroscience behind pain, I go, oh, that doesn't sound crazy to me at all. Like that, that makes sense, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I kind of right. explained the, the neuroscience behind that and how, you know, when we get an injury in one area, sometimes we can get nosy neighbors and it like wakes up the, mm -hmm. it wakes up the neighborhood. And so we can kind of get this kind yeah. of spreading kind of like pain phantom pain, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it just, I, I started one with building that therapeutic alliance, introducing that same, that safe movement. Um, and then giving her that pain neuroscience education about her, you know, the body's sensitive alarm system about those nosy neighbors. Um, mm -hmm. and then I didn't introduce pain reprocessing until about visit five. Um, and mm -hmm. so we did pain reprocessing with gradual progression of activity. Um, mm -hmm. and pain, pain reprocessing, you know, for anyone who's wondering, okay, but like, what is it? Like, what is it actually doing? Right. Um, it, it, it's mm -hmm. a combination of one explaining the neuroscience behind pain and then two mm -hmm. teaching the person how to lead into their pain through a lens of safety right. and kind of observe that from a mm -hmm. place of safety instead of running away from it or trying to fix it or get rid of it. Um, and so this is done mm -hmm. through a process called somatic tracking. Um, I, I know you're familiar mm -hmm. with like Peter Levine's work and, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, those kind of like somatic techniques, but it, somatic tracking is essentially a combination of like mindfulness, like observation of the sensation, mm -hmm. um, and then safety right. reappraisal, like, you know, affirming to the patient that, Hey, this is, this is safe, right? We know that there's nothing inherently dangerous about, you know, um, the position that your body is in. Um, and then mm -hmm. also positive affect induction. So, you know, this can be done with humor. This can be done with creating visualization, mm -hmm. but this is process is a little bit, it's a little bit, um, it's kind of playful, which is really nice. Um, and it, it's mm -hmm. really fun to do, especially when the patient is like really curious and, and on board. Um, with it. Um, and so it, it can be a really fun process. And for this patient in particular that I'm talking about, um, it's really fun. Um, she, she's genuinely curious about what she is she's feeling. And um, we just gradually began to do more and more. Um, so while we weren't doing mm -hmm. like a huge myriad of exercises, she would come back to me like the next week and go, I walked my kids mm -hmm. home and I took the gravel path. Like I, I couldn't take the gravel path for this many, you know, for this mm -hmm. long because it was so painful to me. And, or she'd come back and go, I played with my kids on the playground. I, she has four, four kids. Um, so mm -hmm. at the end, when we, you know, when we did her reevaluation, her pain went from an eight to a zero. She could wear any shoes that she wanted to. Um, her mm -hmm. range of motion, her joint mobility, and her strength all normalized, which I never really had to do any manual therapy, um, you know, to, to increase that. It was just her nervous system just wouldn't allow her feet to move. Um, and so all yeah. of that normalized. She was able to run and play with her kids and go back to the gym. Um, her uh, lower extremity functional scale score, which is a standardized outcome measure that we utilize, went from a 38% function to 95% function, which is huge. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a quote that I took from her, she said, I feel like I got my life back. I can be me again. Um, and so that was, that's kind of like a golden star example of, you know, yeah. how this work can work for somebody who, um, you know, it's just kind of the, the right thing at the right time. Um, but I yeah. have to say that there's also a lot of 
um, barriers, you know, too. You know, I have a lot of people that come to mm-hmm. me and they know I'm certified in pain reprocessing therapy and they show up and they go, look, I've, I've read the books. I, I know that this is what I have going on. And then they're so desperate to fix it, which rightfully so, right? We, we don't right. want that pain, mm-hmm. you know, uh, to be with us forever. But that kind of, you know, it, it, it turns up the, the pressure, right? Mm-hmm. And it turns up that, um, you know, those expectations kind of ramp up the nervous system and it's kind of counterintuitive, right? Because right. it has to be a process where we kind of let go, get a little playful with it, and we're not trying to force anything to happen, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, which can be a, a big barrier, um, yeah. for, for a lot of folks and, and that's okay. You know? Yeah. Thank you for telling us about that case, because I think it's so important that people need to hear real world, real life, uh, cases and see what we're talking about in theory and all the neuroscience, but actual in practice and how it looks like and, and how much success it can achieve. So, you know, it's, she's gotten her life back and so many other people who, feel like they haven't gotten their lives back can also through this modality. So I appreciate what you're doing and thank you for taking the time to speak with me on this. Absolutely. Um, there's, you know, there's obviously so much to say about, uh, you know, pain and neuroscience and in, in this world. And there's so much nuance and, and healing in this work. And I'm just, I'm really excited to, to be on the path and, and do the work that I do. And I'm so thankful for, Awesome. Thanks, Britton.